Good morning, all those who uh, are seeing us from Canada. Uh, welcome everyone to our first uh, of the very many uh, series of understanding of traditional laws. My name is Robert. Robert um, first and foremost, uh, thank you to, to all our speakers who agreed to join us uh, and take part in this our first ever webinar, I think tradition. And uh, I'll introduce the speakers. First and foremost, uh, Professor Robert Curry, who is a transnational criminal law specialist. Uh, author of International Transitional, Transnational Criminal Law Book 2010. I'll put the. We are writing for my schools. Mm -hmm. We are writing uh, for my start. Mr. Robert, you're muted. We can't hear you. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for start, I wish to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Professor Robert Curry, who is a transnational criminal law specialist and author of International and Transnational Criminal Law Book 2010. I'll put the description under uh, the charts. Also, uh, is a nominee of Walter Owen Book Prize and a professor of law at Dallas University, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, we also have uh, Wilson, Honorable Wilson Radin, who is a Young African Leader Initiative uh, Fellow and a representative of the Kenya Magistrate and Judges Wilson, uh, Dika region. He is joining. Um, uh, thirdly, we have uh, Catherine Mwaniki, who is currently joining. Yes, uh, we have Catherine Mwaniki, who is a Senior Assistant Director of Public Prosecution and of International Cooperation and Legal, uh, Mutual Legal Assistant and Request and Extradition. Uh, fourthly, we have uh, Honorable uh, Jesse Saruni, who is our very own, our Chairman and President. Uh, we have uh, lastly we have Mr. Kama Macau Steve, who is a regional integration and uh, East Africa Community Law scholar, and also a lecturer at our at the Mount Kenya University School of Law. So welcome everyone. My, everyone, my name is Robert, and uh, uh, our Saruni, Mr. Saruni, Sandy, unmute yourself. All right, thank you very much. Uh, are you able to hear me, Mr. Robert? Yes, yes, we can hear you, sir. Uh, can we uh, oh, three right. remarks? Oh, uh, thank you very much. I want to appreciate uh, everyone who has joined in to this uh, very noble meeting. I want to appreciate uh, Professor Curry for coming in to join us during this special uh, moment. 
that we are having to discuss about uh, issues of extradition. Uh, my name is Jesse Saruni. I'm the president uh, of Kenya University Parklands Law Campus. And I am really humbled to welcome the entire student population, the general public to join us in these uh, discussions. I also want to appreciate everyone joining us from uh, Kenya, from Uganda, from Tanzania, from the USA and from Canada. We have been having a good relationship with uh, most people from different countries and uh, especially the special friendship and uh, partnership that we have cultivated with a professor. We want to appreciate that and uh, even the people of Canada uh, especially even with uh, between Mount Kenya University and uh, Dollhouse University. And I hope this is something that we can uh, proceed on with and cultivate it and make it uh, uh, empower more, more people. I also want to thank the entire panelists for turning up today and uh, agreeing to take part in this uh, very noble initiative. This is the first volume and we hope to have several more and I hope that uh, will st uh, still be available for the other sessions. And uh, extradition is a very unique topic that uh, people really need to understand. We have in Kenya had issues of extradition and it's only good that uh, people take time to understand issues of extradition. We saw the Akasha case, which was very prominent uh, some time back. And I really want to appreciate everyone and to uh, thank everyone for taking time to participate in this. And I'm hopeful that it will be very productive and we'll learn a lot. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Yes, um, thank you for that. So uh, first, first and foremost, we want to start with uh, extradition laws, uh, the international perspective of uh, how they view the, the international laws. The extradition laws. So um, I'll invite the first speaker, who is uh, Professor Kelly, Professor Robert Kelly, uh, to uh, take us through uh, what does extradition mean, uh, what is the work and the purpose of uh, extradition. Over to you, Professor. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Everyone able to hear me? Please let me know in the chat if you can't. Yes, yes, yes. So we can be able to hear you. Terrific. Uh, I just want to say a quick thank you uh, and and tell you what an honor it is to be uh, to be invited to participate in a great effort by a by a wonderful university. I have actually been to Nairobi. I was uh, I was there to your fair city about seven years ago to do some training uh, with the media and students and with some. Uh, some honored guests from the Department of Public Prosecutions. So I'm delighted to, to sort of be back in Kenya in a virtual way. And uh, I want to give a special thank you to Robert Mutria who reached out to me and, uh, and, and invited me to join this, this conference, with, this webinar, which I'm very happy to, uh, to be involved in. And Robert has been uh, a fearless organizer and um, a great uh, student to interact with. So I want to extend special thanks to him. Uh, I also am very pleased and honored to be speaking today with very eminent uh, speakers, uh, very distinguished people. And I know that I'm going to learn as much uh, about extradition uh, today as, as others are, because there's so much uh, interesting that's happening in the African uh, context. So uh, let me uh, set up quickly by answering Robert's question. On, a very, on the very basics of what we're talking about, uh, which is extradition. Extradition is the formal legal process by which an individual who is either wanted for a crime in one country or has been convicted for a crime in a country, uh, but has fled to another country. So it's the process by which the person is sent back, either to face prosecution or to uh, or to serve their sentence. And one, uh, one bit of terminology I want to throw out right at the beginning, because it will help uh, frame our discussion, I think, is that it's very useful to think of extradition cases as involving two countries, the requesting state and the requested state. So the requesting state is the, uh, is the country that wants to get the individual back, 
so that they can be prosecuted. And the requested state is the country where the individual is located and, uh, and, and is being asked to surrender that individual back to the requesting state. So we keep those two distinctions in mind. I think that will be, um, I think that will be very helpful. So important to remember that, uh, and I guess I'll finish my answer on this question here. Important to remember that extradition is a formal legal process. It usually involves uh, the courts as, as well as the government. Of, uh, of, of certainly of the requested state and often of the requesting state. So it is different from other kinds of processes that are involved with immigration law um, and, and, and maybe more informal processes. It's a very, uh, it's a very formal process involving law on, on both sides. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll conclude on that, Robert, and I'll, I'll uh, happily uh, take more questions. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so what are some of the international legal instruments and framework that uh, regulate extradition and uh, the purpose of uh, having this, uh, this uh, legal framework in uh, regulating uh, international uh, uh, extradition laws? Sure, okay. Um, I, I think you, the question is an excellent one because again, it mentions legal frameworks, right? Because this is a, this is a legal, uh, process. And when you, when you have any issue or any case that involves two countries, then immediately you know that international law is going to be involved. And extradition almost always uh, is conducted between countries by way of a treaty. And I suspect, you know, everyone has an idea of what a treaty is. A treaty uh, in its simplest terms is an agreement between two states or between a number of states uh, where each each state uh, under each country undertakes obligations, so extradition almost always proceeds by way of, of treaty, uh, either bilateral treaty, which is to say a treaty that's between two countries, or a multilateral treaty, which uh, which is a treaty that's between a number of countries. And so, when we speak of an international uh, of international legal instruments and frameworks that involve extradition. We're talking about quite a lot of treaties in the end. Uh, everything from uh, a simple bilateral treaty, uh, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a, a treaty between uh, Kenya and Uganda, for example, a bilateral extradition treaty. And uh, there are also um, uh, multilateral treaties. So uh, just as an example, uh, and we'll talk more about this later, but the uh, Vienna Narcotics Convention of 1988 has provisions in it uh, where any of the countries who are party to that treaty can uh, have an extradition process with any of the other countries who are parties to that treaty. And that's quite a large number of countries. I think there are approximately 188 countries that are party to that treaty. So you might have a, a, everything from the bilateral to the very large multilateral and, uh, and everything in between. And that's at the international level then the legal framework at the domestic level, which is to say at the level of the country, is simply that every country has its own extradition laws. It's going to have a, a set of laws that, that uh, create and regulate the legal process uh, by which people are extradited from that country or which allow the government to request extradition from, uh, from a foreign country. So a way of summing it up would be to say that extradition legal frameworks are both uh, they are at the international level, they're bilateral and multilateral by way of treaty. And at the domestic level, every country has some kind of, of domestic extradition law. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. You, Professor, you mentioned a, a very key issue that uh, there are both the bilateral approach and multilateral approach to extradition laws. So uh, my question, my area of concern would be, uh, what is the difference between these two, uh, bilateral approach and the multilateral approach? Sure. Um, I think a, a good way to start here is to note, and, and I'm, you know, there are uh, people, uh, eminent speakers here who know a great deal about extradition law. So I don't, I don't pretend I'm the only person in the room who knows about these things, but um, most extradition is carried out by way of bilateral 
treaties. And bilateral treaties, of course, are treaties between two countries. And that's the case because uh, countries tend to be quite choosy about who they are going to, uh, which, which other countries they are going to have extradition relations with. Because a great deal can depend on the mutual opinion that the two countries have of each other. Uh, do they respect each other's legal processes, for example? Uh, do they have good foreign relations between them? So in, in any, any given country uh, might have bilateral treaties with maybe a small number of countries, maybe a large number. So uh, Canada, for example, has, uh, I think, about 90 bilateral extradition arrangements and treaties. So when you consider there are 194 countries in the world, that's, uh, that's interesting, right? Canada has chosen uh, to have extradition treaties only with some of those countries and not with all. Now, that's not to say that Canada has looked at every country in the world and refused uh, over 100 of them, but simply that there isn't necessarily the interest uh, or the need to have extradition relations. Uh, with, with those particular countries. Uh, the, at the multilateral level, it's, it's a different kind of dynamic because multilateral extradition, again, tends to come from large scale treaties that are geared towards crime suppression. So uh, one example, Robert, that you and I discussed before the meeting was the United Nations uh, Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. So that, like the Vienna Narcotics Convention that I mentioned a few minutes ago, that's a large treaty, a United Nations level treaty with many, many uh, countries that are party to it. And the idea there is to facilitate suppression of transnational crime by saying to all of the countries that will sign this treaty, look, if you, you may not have bilateral extradition treaties with, with all of the countries, but in a case involving transnational organized crime, you can use this multilateral treaty as a way of having extradition relations, right? So uh, just as an example, uh, I believe Canada has no extradition treaty with uh, Indonesia. Uh, we don't have a bilateral treaty with them. But for example, say there was a, 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 an accused person wanted for a transnational organized crime offense, in Canada, and that person had fled to, fled to Indonesia, the government of Canada could call up the government of Indonesia and say, look, under the UN Transnational Organized Crime Convention, we would like you to extradite that individual back to Canada. Even though we normally don't do extradition between us, with, with regard to this particular crime, we can do so. Uh, aspect uh, uh, the role the the extradition is also a role of uh, the court so my uh, next uh, uh, issue uh, what to ask is to honorable wilson radin uh, what is the role of the court uh, when it comes to extradition uh, processes good good morning just admit from uh, okay first of all I thank you, Robert, for having this meeting. I'm sorry that I've been able to come in late, but it's because I was experiencing some technical issues and then I had to speak to a colleague to allow me to use her laptop. That's why my name is registered under her. Yes, you first have a very good question. You just ask about the role of the court uh, when it comes to extradition. And that is just basically the role that you have said yourself because the court is the one to make a determination on whether the fugitive, uh, I'll use the name fugitive for now, if whether the fugitive is to be extradited and for the court to make that decision, it will have to rely on all the parameters that have been set by the law. And of importance, I will mention that uh, we have a statute, we have a statute in place called the Extradition Contiguous and Foreign Countries Act. Apart from that, we also have the Extradition Commonwealth Countries Act and uh, that is not the only scenario that exists for the court for purpose of extradition. Eh? Just like the way the speaker has said, Kenya has also entered into some treaties, some bilateral treaties on extradition. 
and of importance, I'll mention that United Nations uh, Convention on, on Transnational Crime, because that also is a basis of extradition. So as soon as the application is, uh, is made to court uh, by the office of the DPP, the court just moves in to find out if the parameters have been met and we do, uh, yeah, and basically our work is to comply with the law. Yes, Robert. Uh -huh. Robert? Yes, uh, so uh, uh, what are the, the requirements now to surrender this person uh, to another country? Sorry, like the way I have said there. Eh? Yes. Uh, yes, like the way I have said, the requirements have already been uh, laid out under the statute. Eh? Yes. So for us, the only important thing is that if whether the offense is the one that is, is extra tangible, and for it to be an extraditable, an extradition offense is a crime that is punishable under the law of the country seeking extradition and under the Kenyan law or under a law that can be applied as extraterritorial offense in Kenya. Then uh, of importance again, we have the statutory grounds when it comes to refusal to extradition. And uh, yeah, and here I can only say that, uh, yeah, and, and here I can only say that it applies when it comes to the issues of uh, politics. Eh? Then the other thing is uh, another parameter is if whether or not there exists a treaty. Like they have already mentioned, the framework, the United Nations Convention on Transnational Crime, eh? it can still, even if there's no bilateral treaty which has been signed with Kenya, mm -hmm. and a country is making that request through the ODPP, that is something which I have seen uh, the courts being able to rely on. Yes, Robert. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, to, uh, so, when it comes to matters of uh, foreign uh, courts, uh, when they issue, when they want to extradite um, someone, for example, we say a uh, person is in uh, Tanzania or in Canada, and uh, they want to extradite that person, does that uh, information come through the court, or uh, how does the court now say yes, this person can be extradited to 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 Canada? Who is already in Kenya? How does the court now take? How does the court take that initiative to say now this person can be extradited to, to Canada? Okay, of importance, eh? Yes. Of importance, and for the purpose of this direction, the most important thing which I see happening around is that a warrant of arrest eh, will have to be issued, and then it is on the basis of that warrant of arrest that the Kenyan authorities will be acting on, eh? and then presenting that suspect before the courts. Yeah. Then uh, I know for sure, you see, the role of the court is more of, of it is more of a up the passing. I'll call it passing. Because it's mainly between the ODPP. The ODPP is the one who prosecutes these ones before the court. Eh? But even before that happens, a warrant of arrest will have to be issued by, will have to be issued by the court. Eh? So that is the first step, a warrant existence of it. Right? Sometimes I see I see it comes from the Interpol, so DCI, Interpol, ODPP, then finally it lands up in court. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Yeah. So what are some of the appeal processes of uh, an extradition? So for example, we give an uh, example of uh, Chris Okelo, Okemo, sorry. Uh, what are some of the advanced, uh, the the appeal processes if I don't want, if Chris doesn't want to be extradited to face uh, those uh, uh, offenses there, the charges there, what are some of the appeal processes? Okay. If you look at it well, eh, uh, the courts, um, if you look at the statutes which I have mentioned, that is the Extradition Contiguous and Foreign Countries Act and also the Extradition Commonwealth Countries Act. They say the resident magistrate. So, so basically, if you don't want to be extradited, because extradition cases in Kenya are had in the magistrate's court. Eh? So if a court is to give its decision, the next place to appeal is the high court. Eh? I may not uh, specifically be able to touch on uh, the matters which are alive in court. What I will just say is that uh, if you are dissatisfied with the decision of the magistrate, then it goes on appeal to the high court. Then from the high court, of course, it will end up in the court of appeal. You see, all this time we're just tackling extradition. Right? So far, 
I haven't seen, uh, I don't know, I don't know whether, I haven't seen any case in the Supreme Court which touches it on exhibition, eh? but even be that as it may, it will be so curious, eh? because I know sometimes exhibition are matters of great public interest, eh? and uh, it will also be able to, to set out the law for now, but as I'm telling you, now the appeal process is just the High Court, then Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's too much. Yeah. So, so uh, what are your experiences uh, when it comes to expedition and uh, the difference between exchange of prisoners and expedition? Exchange of prisoners uh, and expedition. Um, I think at this time I will share my experience a bit on this issue. Sometimes back in 2016, was it 2016? Yes. Uh, I was fortunate enough that the Yes, that there is a treaty that Kenya was signing with China for the purpose of extradition and mutual legal assistance. I was invited to be part of the delegation and to be part of the meeting, yeah? And uh, by experience, you see, when these things are to happen via a treaty, then the expectations are quite high, yeah? Yeah, the expectations are, are quite high and, uh, uh, Robert, just ask uh, if you can just if you can just be able to repeat the question again. Just repeat it again. Then, sorry. Um, I was asking uh, your experience um, when it comes to matters of expedition uh, and uh, the, uh, the difference between expedition and um, passage of prisoners. Oh, okay. Extradition, as it has already been described, eh? extradition uh, is more of a judicial process, so as to speak. Eh? But when it comes to an exchange of prisoners, exchange of prisoners can be done uh, via country to country. I'll go back to the one I was talking about, uh, Kenya versus China. Yeah? The Kenya versus China, we had hoped, we had reproached that uh, we will be able to get our Kenyans who are uh, held up in Chinese uh, prisons, mainly because of drug trafficking offenses. Yeah? So, because as at that time it happened that we had some cyber criminals from Taiwan. I don't know if you know that experience. Cyber criminals from Taiwan also we thought maybe we could do an exchange, but clearly it uh, didn't happen. So the difference with extradition is that extradition is a is a judicial process. Yes, and exchange of prisoners is just that one is done bilaterally by the countries who are partners to an agreement. Oh. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, back to you, Professor uh, Robert Curry. Uh, I, what are some of the cause of extradition? Sorry, Ro Sorry Robert, your question was uh, was obscured a bit there. Okay, okay, sir. Uh, what are some of the principles of extradition uh, as enshrined under the uh, the transnational criminal UN? You need any sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, principles of action. Yes, absolutely. Um, so that you know, it's quite interesting how extradition arrangements and treaties throughout the world uh, use a lot of the same concepts and and principles. Uh, the Transnational Organized Crime Convention is one, uh, but the, you really do see a, a lot of things in common between the arrangements. Uh, one of them was already mentioned by the Honorable Judge, which is the principle of double criminality. And the idea there is simply uh, a country is not going to extradite an individual to a foreign country unless the crime that the individual is accused of is also uh, considered to be a crime in the requested, uh, requested state. Right? So it has to be a crime in, in both states uh, so that you know, countries are not asked to help in the criminal prosecution uh, of someone for, for conduct that they don't consider to be a crime. So that, that's a big one. Um, there is a, a very common uh, principle in, in uh, extradition treaties called the political offense exception. And the idea there is that uh, states will be able to legally refuse to extradite in a situation where the crime that the individual is accused of is a political offense of some kind. Now, different countries treat them, this idea of political offenses 
uh, differently, and there's a lot of texture there. But the idea is simply that the basic idea is that the requested state doesn't want to get involved in the internal politics of the requesting state. So, uh, for example, historically, it's not been unusual where there is a, a maybe a revolt of some kind or a, a coup d'etat or even just a, a really nasty political contest in a country. One party comes out on top and then begins to prosecute uh, people who were from the other party. And those people flee to other states. And in that kind of situation, the requested state uh, would not, typically would not extradite those individuals back because it's just an, in, an internal political dispute. Uh, an interesting case going on right now in, um, in Italy, where one of the leaders of the separatist movement in Spain called the, the ba uh, among the Basque people, uh, has been arrested in Italy and then he was released. And now there's some question about whether Italy is going to extradite him back to Spain because he really is, you know, the argument goes, he's really just a political fugitive. He hasn't committed uh, anything in the way of a crime. So that's certainly um, uh, a big one. Another important principle of extradition is the principle of specialty and or some kind, sometimes called speciality. The idea behind that principle is that if a state agrees to extradite an individual to be prosecuted in another state, they can only be prosecuted for the offense for which they're being extradited. And that allows the requested state to have control over, you know, over its choice to extradite the individual. So let me give you an example, uh, just to use Canada and, and, and Kenya. Uh, let's say that, um, uh, Canada, there was a fugitive in Kenya whom Canada, Canada wanted to prosecute for, um, you know, for robbery. And we asked Kenya to, uh, to extradite the individual for robbery. Part of the agreement uh, on Canada's part would be that we can only prosecute the individual for robbery because otherwise, you know, Kenya might go ahead in good faith, extradite that individual to Canada, and then Canada uh, would prosecute him for any number of crimes and not just robbery. And that, that would be a breach by Canada of good faith uh, and of, of the principle of specialty in that, uh, in that example. So specialty is, uh, is an important one. States find it to be very important because again, it allows them to, to, uh, to uh, uphold their sovereignty and to have some control over the process. Uh, so those are some of the uh, major ones. You see other, other features of extradition uh, treaties as well. Sometimes uh, countries are reluctant to extradite for taxation offenses or for military uh, offenses. Um, one that we have seen increasing in importance in recent years is human rights exceptions to extradition. So for example, there are quite a number of states that will not extradite an individual if they are going to face the death penalty in the requesting state. So in that kind of scenario, the requesting state uh, must guarantee the requested state that if the individual is extradited, they will not face the death penalty. Um, similarly with torture, there are obligations in international human rights law and under the UN Torture Convention that uh, countries may not extradite people to face torture. So uh, an extradition request from a foreign state can be refused on that, on that basis. So that, that's an overview of some of the, the major principles of extradition law. I hope that's, that's useful in answering your question. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, if you have a question, you can just type it uh, under the chat. Uh, I'll ask uh, the question to you. Mr. Robert. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Robert, there's some, uh, yeah. I think there's some exceptions I would need to add at this time, eh? Yes. Yeah, because if you look at the statute, eh? The statute is clear that he, if a person is being charged uh, because of his uh, gender, race, uh, religion, nationality, all those are, are the grounds for prohibition, yeah? And also, in a scenario, if the person has been uh, previously convicted or acquitted of an offense which they want to extradite, that is also a grounds for refusal. That's what I'd like to add at this time. Yes, uh, thank you very much. 
Honorable. Uh, so uh, we also would want to understand uh, the regional perspective uh, when it comes to East Africa and Africa. Um, uh, Mr. So what is uh, the, this understanding of uh, uh, extradition when it comes to Af the East African community? Because we also have a treaty, East African Community Treaty, and uh, the issues, the elements or the principles of extradition are they incorporated in uh, exchange of uh, offenders or fugitives around East Africa community and in Africa? Well, uh, uh, thank you. I don't know whether you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you very well, sir. Yeah, thank you, Robert, uh, for, for this moment. And uh, also I want to thank uh, Professor for such a nice talk, which has come to us very loud and clear. Now, I would like to just mention something before I go to the East African, uh, rather the East African community, is, is, is the, the crimes, rather the offenses that are extraditable. You know, uh, the magistrate there just uh, in a nutshell uh, explained uh, some of these crimes, but I want to make it clear that it's not all crimes that have been committed that are, you know, extraditable. You know, some of them have been provided for under the the, the act, the, 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 the extradition act, the, the, the Kenyan one, and that is murder, manslaughter, rape, and so forth and so forth. So it's not that, you know, somebody has been, uh, or rather has committed a crime, and then then you are told, okay, you are now being extradited to another country. No, it, is, it's not, it does not happen that way. Those offenses are, are well provided for under the, uh, under the, the act, the extradition and contiguous act. Now, what is the procedure? The procedure. Somebody was asking me about the, the, the procedure, the extradition procedure. How is it done? Who are the, the people involved? The magistrate has also not provided uh, a clear uh, a clear explanation on it. And I'm going to, to provide it in a nutshell, in a nutshell. So number one, there is the application part. So there is the application part, the requesting state, state makes an application to the requesting state on, on, on uh, what should uh, happen on how the, the, the fugitive so to speak, uh, the fugitive criminal, how he should be arrested. And then the, there's also the liability bit of it. Um, how is he liable? Uh, is, you know, and that also uh, should also be ascertained by, by, by the, the means of responsible and also the magistrate. And also there's the issues of uh, the warrant uh, towards the, 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 the person, the, the accused person by the magistrate of that country, of this requested uh, uh, country. And also now there is the hearing stage uh, and the evidence to be produced there. Uh, the, the, the magistrate must sit down and uh, hear both sides, you know, the, the accused, the advocates, the prosecutor also there, you know, he must listen to both sides. So again, uh, there is now the committal stage uh, where now the, 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 the accused person is committed rather he, he, also there is plea stage being asked whether you are guilty, not guilty, he must plea. And also now, if he is found guilty now, again, he must be surrendered to the, to the, to the requesting state. I think that in, in a nutshell, that is a, the, the procedure that is followed. Now, uh, and I think I've answered that question. Uh, that question. Now, now, when it comes to the, to the ESC, to, to our region now, there is uh, actually not uh, so much to celebrate because uh, if you look at the, the six countries, the six member countries of, of, of the community, there's actually no treaties. And even if they are there, they are very few. And even if, and the few ones that are actually there, they, uh, they don't touch on extradition, especially looking at the, the, the ESC treaty and the other protocols, uh, you know, the, the common bag and, and so forth, they don't talk about uh, extradition in a, in, a, in, a very, in a very clear or uh, straightforward manner. But specifically, the, the countries, the, you know, Kenya, Rwanda, and so forth, and so forth, Burundi, and so Sudan, they have their own extradition, uh, extradition laws. That is at the domestic level. But when it comes to the ESC community, there is nothing uh, worth uh, uh, popping uh, the champagne, the champagne bottle. But, but, but again, it's not all bloom and gloom. It's not all bloom and gloom. There is uh, actually there are, there are talks that are going on. There, there, there are talks within. The, the, the community, the, the presidents, the head of state, the, the, the DPP of you know the six countries are, are talking to at least uh, 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 you know shed light on, on, on extradition matters, on uh, what should happen if somebody is uh, you know uh, found guilty in one of these uh, six member countries, and what should happen, what what is the procedure, what is the legal procedure if it's supposed to be tried, it's supposed to be tried 
in 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 another in, in another country outside outside the region so th that is it about yes it, it's not such it's not very very clear uh, uh, on what on on matters extradition the procedure the laws apart from now the domestic the domestic system on extradition thank you robert yes uh, that's a very good uh, point robert uh, about uh, the domestic aspect of extradition so at this point i will uh, invite uh, the dpp uh, Catherine Moniki to uh, explain to us uh, the procedures the process the document that they support to request an extradition and the role of uh, uh, DPP when it comes to extradition and uh, our role when it comes to matters of uh, legal assistance and the difference. Thank you, Robert. And uh, I appreciate talking after my eminent uh, colleagues in this uh, top under this topic, understanding extradition laws. And I'll pick it up from where they have left. Uh, Rob has explained properly what extradition is all about. And um, basically uh, in Kenya, we have uh, the domestic legislations and these are the two legislations that have been mentioned. That is the Extradition, Contiguous and Foreign Countries Act. That is chapter 76. And we have the Extradition for Commonwealth Countries Act uh, chapter 77. And the difference between this act for the countries under Commonwealth, the countries under Commonwealth are governed by CAP 77. That's the extradition uh, Commonwealth Countries Act. This is what governs the process of extradition for countries within the Commonwealth. And for extradition of countries not within the Commonwealth, they are now under the purview of a CAP 76. That is the extradition contiguous and foreign act, just to at least let you understand the difference. Um, and also the difference between this act is the instrument that is used to initiate the proceedings in court. For the Commonwealth, that is CAP 77, the instrument that is used or the document that is used to initiate an extradition, proce extradition proceedings in court Uh, and meet, madam. Sorry, have you been listening? Have you, I hope I was not on mute throughout. No, no, no. A few seconds ago. Okay. So um, I've explained the difference between these two acts so that you can understand. One is for Commonwealth countries. The other one is for all other countries that do not fall within the Commonwealth. Um, for the instrument that is used to initiate. Uh, proce extradition proceedings in court under the Commonwealth Act, that is CAP 77, the document or instrument is usually referred to as authority to proceed. Under the Contiguous and Foreign Countries Act, CAP 76, the instrument or document that is used to initiate uh, the proceedings in court is called an order. As rightfully said, those are, these two are the two domestic legislations that we have. Um, for the international instrument, we are also uh, governed by Article 2, sub Article 6 of the Constitution of Kenya, which is very clear that any uh, treaty convention or agreement that Kenya has signed becomes or forms part of the law in Kenya. So um, we are then now guided by various uh, conventions, treaties, for instance, the one that has been mentioned, the United Nations Transnational Convention on Organized Crime. But it's important to note that that convention only governs offenses which are transnational. And uh, under, I believe, Article 2 of the convention has clearly stated when the convention can be used. For instance, the offense has to be an offense punishable by, I think, four or five years. There are those. Uh, there's a criteria they have given for the offenses that can fall within the, that convention. So basically for us, uh, we then get strength from uh, the international conventions which have been, which have been mentioned. And uh, I will start now with extradition because in international cooperation, we have, as Rob has said, we have the formal, uh, the, the, the 
we have the formal cooperation, and that is basically the extradition, mutual legal assistance uh, requests, and uh, what has been touched on on transfer of prisoners. For the informal cooperation, we have what we call the assistance we get from different, like for, this, for, for instance, police to police cooperation, Interpol or IAPCO. Though that is what we call the informal cooperation that can assist. So the role of the ODPP and uh, one thing, the case that you have mentioned, that is the Chris Okemos case is currently before the Supreme Court. It was coming up for hearing today, but it was adjourned. Um, it is good if you can follow it up because it will then give the, the critical role of the ODPP and the Attorney General. It will establish the, the role, who plays which role in extradition. So that I would encourage you, that is an important uh, case that you can follow. It's currently before the Supreme Court. And as Honorable Radin said, a matter that is in court, we will not be able to discuss it, but I will encourage you to follow it up and uh, see, see the outcome because they will give the definite, clear and definite role of the Attorney General and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. To be short, the Office of the DPP wants an ex, and as Robert, uh, Rob said, is the requesting state and the requested state. So I will start with the role of the DPP for, as a requesting state. We have a fugitive outside, for instance, and I'll just give an instance in Tanzania. We have a fugitive, a person who committed a crime in Kenya and has escaped to uh, Tanzania. Um, the role of the DPP or what happens is that the investigative agency completes the investigations. Once they find that there's enough evidence against this person, I'll call the person fugitive criminal. Once they find that the fugitive criminal has established a case, they then go to court and seek a warrant of arrest. Once they seek the warrant of arrest, they then forward the duplicate file and the warrant of arrest in duplicate form to us. We then prepare a, an extradition request and uh, with all the necessary documents, which I, I believe I'll discuss later with the necessary documents. But once the DPP is satis satisfied that there is sufficient evidence against this fugitive criminal, and as Rob said, or as we know, extradition are treaty based. Once we find that we have a treaty agreement with the, a certain country, we then prepare the agreement and, uh, once we, and the only person authorized to sign the agreement, the extradition agreement is the director of public prosecutions, not even I who is the head, it's only the director of public prosecutions who can sign that document. Because in that document, we must authenticate that, the DPP must authenticate that warrant of arrest. That that warrant of arrest is a genuine document. The signature belongs to that specific magistrate. We then forward the request to the attorney general, who then forwards to the, to the respective uh, country. But for Commonwealth countries, we have what we call the Harare scheme or the London scheme of extradition. So all countries that fall within the Commonwealth, we hold the strength on that uh, treaty. That even though we have not signed a treaty, an extradition treaty with Tanzania, and Tanzania is a Commonwealth country, we then get support from that treaty because as we said, uh, extradition are treaty based. For Commonwealth countries, they are safe under that London scheme or what is called the Harare scheme. So for the other countries, we must establish that there is a treaty. These are Kenya being the requesting state. And then we wait for the respective country, for instance, for Tanzania to do what they have to do. And uh, when they tell us that they have gotten orders, we then go and uh, pick our, our fugitive uh, criminal in the respective country. For requesting um, um, extraditions from, we, no, we become the requested state where countries are requesting us they usually pass through the diplomatic channels. And the diplomatic channels, it means they're passing through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. From the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they're channeled to the Attorney General. From the Attorney General, they then come to us. Um, once DPP is satisfied that one, there is what we call the double criminality, double criminality that the offense that has been committed in that country is similar in nature to an offense that has been committed in Kenya. And it doesn't have to be in the same words. 
but the basically the acts are similar. So once we confirm that, and we confirm that there is no, it's not politically, it's not, it has nothing to do with politics, or it's not, uh, it's not of political nature. Um, and uh, we then establish that the fugitive criminal is in Kenya, because that is then how we use our investigative agencies, because we can't initiate an extradition proceeding if we do not have or understand or get to know that the fugitive is in Kenya. Once we get to know that the fugitive is in Kenya and we are satisfied that the request has met our threshold, what we do, uh, DPP signs either what I have said, the authority to proceed for Commonwealth countries and for non-Commonwealth countries, we sign what we call an order. The order then is filed in court with an affidavit requesting for a warrant or a, of arrest because we have to do what we call reciprocal backing of warrants. As much as we have received a warrant of arrest from that res respective, respective country, we must come and what we call reciprocal banking of warrants. So uh, we then make an application in court and ask for the Kenyan courts, the courts in Kenya to issue a warrant of arrest. Once they issue the warrant of arrest, uh, once they issue the warrant of arrest, we then, the warrant of arrest is then addressed to the investigative agency, for instance, the Directorate of Criminal Investigations. They then arrest the person. Robert, I will just go through everything, then you'll see what else needs to be added. Once we get, once the DCI arrests the person, he's then availed in court. Once he's availed in court, we then now present our extradition documents. But the, mainly the first thing what happens is arguments of bail, whether he should be released on bail pending the hearing of the extradition proceedings. Once that is done, we then now get an opportunity to canvass our application before the court. And basically we'll be telling the court that we have met, uh, there's a legal basis for the extradition. And that is basically uh, treaty based. Um, there is an ex it is an extraditable crime. And uh, basically this uh, extradition does not fall within what we call the restrictions on surrender. So our role basically is to satisfy the court. Then the court, then the, the fugitive criminal will have an opportunity to uh, represent himself and advance his uh, reasons for or against, for or, uh, against his uh, extra, extradition to respective country. Then uh, basically the court makes a ruling. And uh, again, if the ruling is in our favor, we have 14 days, you're not extradited immediately. We have a window period of 14 days. Within the 14 days period, the fugitive criminal should have gone to the high court in the nature of a habeas corpus, in the nature of a habeas corpus. Then once they go to the high court, the high court then determines again, whether this person should be extradited or not. Once the high court rules again in our favor, they have an opportunity, as the uh, Honorable Radin said, to go to the Court of Appeal. But in the, mean, in the meantime, if they don't go within these 14 periods, once we have the order from the Magistrates Court, we then go back to the Attorney General. The Attorney General will then give us the final document to extradite you. It's called the Warrant of Surrender. That Warrant of Surrender is the one which gives Kenya the authority to remove someone from Kenya to that country. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Madam ODPP. So, uh, uh, Kelly, uh, tell us uh, the, how long does this process take? For example, when the you re, when the court needs to find and tell receive the tradition order request, how until when that person is extradited to, uh, to, to that country, the requesting state? How how long does that process take? And also, Kelly, tell us about. Um, the plea, the plea agreement, the office deals with the issues of plea agreement and plea bargain, and also the cost. Who bears this cost of extradition? Um, the period it takes in court, uh, we all understand there are very many factors that uh, come that come into place and we, we are not able. We try our best to ensure that the, um, the process is fast, but remember every person must be given 
opportunity to can uh, to converse their matter in court. Um, it takes some time from my experience, it takes months, but the moment the court gives us that uh, order or agrees with us that this person should be extradited, there is that 14 day period, which we cannot even touch you. We cannot touch you. And that's the only period that is defined in the statute. Um, for the rest, we are not able to, to determine. Uh, so we always hope and uh, because again, uh, with our international partners, we need to uh, uh, cooperate and effectively, we always try and uh, fast track the process, but there's no definite time. My experience is always months. The only thing that is definite is the 14 window period after an order has been given. Cost for extradition, uh, from my experience, we bear basically, uh, we bear the costs, but there are times there are some costs which are beyond what we can bear. Uh, because basically uh, the costs we have are for looking for the fugitive, uh, maintaining the fugitive in custody, uh, filing documents, those ones we bear. But if there's any cost which is beyond what we can bear, we then uh, have a discussion with the requesting state. And then we mutually agree on the way forward. But from my experience, most of the extradition requests, we have been bearing our costs. And, but uh, we, in our, uh, extradition request, that thing also is factored. And uh, we usually have, we usually communicate with the requesting state even prior to. So that is something we can agree on this, either us or uh, contributed or them. But from my experience, Kenya has been bearing our costs and they have been bearing our costs in their respective countries. We've not had a country telling us to bear costs for the extradition. Uh, plea bargaining would take a long time, but it's anchored in the act. Um, when someone has been charged with an offense, uh, we and the person is willing to come and uh, plea bargain, um, there is a, an instru a document in which you enter into an agreement with an accused person. And then, then basically, if he accepts, uh, we then file the document in court. And basically it is for the accused person to plead guilty to either the offense or a lesser offense. And then uh, uh, basically, but when it comes to plea bargaining for sentencing is not our domain. That is the sole domain of the judiciary. So for us is basically to enter into an accused person approaches us and tells us that he wishes to enter into a plea uh, bargaining and wants to plead guilty to a specific offense or a lesser offense. For instance, in murder, he wants to plead guilty to manslaughter, and we feel that uh, we are satisfied that what he did could be of a lesser offense. We both sign the document, and uh, he's explained for, and then we file the document in court, and then the court then goes through the process of trying to confirm that the, he was not coerced, he entered in good faith, and then once the court accepts the plea agreement, we then go into the uh, angle of him being uh, uh, found guilty of the offense that is in the plea agreement. And then um, the court then sentences the person. But of course, there are factors we consider that he has entered into a plea bargaining. And those are issues that can be brought in the sentencing uh, factor. And uh, basically, whatever we have uh, agreed in the plea agreement, if the, we find that the uh, accused person has lied, the plea agreement can be set aside and he will be charged with the initial offense. And uh, basically we can never use the plea agreement against the uh, accused person if he ever decides at one point to step away from the plea agreement. It's a topic I believe would take a whole day to discuss, but I, I believe that would be for now. Thank you uh, very much, Madam. So uh, lastly, the last question and uh, from your office, how, what are some of the examples of uh, high profile cases you know, that your office has dealt with uh, when it comes to extradition? Uh, what are some of the people that we know, we remember the uh, Akasha brothers, uh, Ashbabi. So what are some of the high profile cases and uh, do you have any like, uh, statistics that are how many people are extradited annually out of Kenya? Okay, um, the, the last one we had, which we went to court for us was a, a success case. And especially because we were trying to do and invoke article two, sub article two of the constitution that any convention 
or agreement that we have signed has formed part of the law is one case of Mansur Muhammad Sar, alias Mansur. I can send you then the judgment. Um, he was uh, charged with various offenses uh, from wildlife to narcotics and uh, he was wanted by and indicted by the United States of America. And uh, we successfully managed to indict him and he's currently facing uh, uh, the indictment of the charges in the United States. So he's currently in the United States. This happened last year, 2020, that's our recent one. We have had also another one uh, currently, but I don't remember the full names, but he's called Rage. Again, he was wanted in the United States for the offense of uh, wire fraud. Um, most of our cases have, have been put on hold because of what we said this matter in the Supreme Court, uh, which actually is touching on Commonwealth countries. And uh, basically because it was a request from a Commonwealth country, and it's basically touching on the role of uh, the Attorney General and the DPP who is to initiate. So most cases are pending in court. Uh, we, we are just mentioning them there. So you, you can notice from the year 2018, 2019 to to date, we've not really uh, progressed much because of that, but we are hoping that the issue will be finalized in the Supreme Court, then we can go about it. And um, another classic case was this one for the Tanzanian, the gold. And uh, basically one of the fugitives was also wanted for having uh, with large sums of money in Kenya, um, we returned them, we managed to return the money back to Tanzania. And um, we've also repatriated someone to Tanzania. So um, within this short period, we've not really done much, but uh, we are waiting once the Supreme Court matter is determined, there'll be a floodgate of them. And uh, as we'll be finalizing most of them in court. Thank you very much, Madam. So, uh... You've brought up an aspect of uh, political offense is not an extraditable offense. So uh, I would also Professor Robert Curry talked about uh, human rights uh, touches on uh, issues of extradition. My question would be go to Justice Haruni who is an expert in uh, refugee law. So uh, what are some, uh, when a refugee seeks uh, extradition, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Asylum seeker. So, sorry, asylum seeker goes when well, he has committed, for example, a case of Ezekiel Okemo. Sorry, uh, Ezekiel uh, Ochuka, who during 1982, during the coup, uh, went to uh, Tanzania for, for refuge. So, uh, how do you relate the human rights aspect and the, the narrowment back to country where he's running from? Uh, the question goes to this is how. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Robert, for uh, this opportunity. And I want to say that uh, it's quite humbling to speak after the brilliant panel uh, has spoken. Well, issues of human rights are very sensitive. And uh, I would like to say that uh, fundamental and uh, essential human rights in Kenya are covered in Chapter 4 of the Kenyan Constitution, and uh, which came into effect in uh, 2010. And uh, the Bill of Rights in Kenya is one of the most comprehensive uh, Bill of Rights we have in the world, which uh, covers issues of uh, basic social, political, and economic rights. And uh, if you go through uh, part two of chapter four of uh, the Constitution of Kenya, you'll find the different rights that are stipulated there. And uh, of most importance is the right to life, where every person has the right to life, regardless of uh, conviction or uh, whatever issue that you've uh, been convicted of. Uh, the constitution recognizes this uh, beginning at conception. It begins at conception. So even when you're proceeding with your life, this is a right that is fundamental. And uh, apart from that, we have the right to equality and freedom from discrimination. So no one has right to be discriminated, uh, right to freedom and security of the person. We have prohibition of slavery, servitude and forced labor. And also captured in, the, in, the, in several international treaties are non-derogable and uh, universal rights. These are 
there are four main rights that are can be said to be not derogable, which are right to life, prohibition from uh, uh, pro prohibition from torture and other forms of cruel and inhuman degrading treatment and punishment. We have prohibition on slavery, and we have freedom from exposed factor, which is uh, basically freedom from uh, being subjected to retroactive criminal laws. That means that uh, if a law comes to existence today and you committed a crime that was not captured uh, under the, uh, as, a, as a crime yesterday, you cannot, be said, you cannot be subjected to that law. So these are the main rights that are of importance to issues of extradition. And uh, I would also like to say that uh, when, a country, when countries are looking at how or determining how to, whether to extradite someone or not, they will also consider the level of treatment that this person will be subjected to. And uh, I appreciate that uh, Professor captured that very well. And uh, a good example is the Swaring versus United Kingdom case. In this case, the uh, extradited, uh, the person to, who was subject to extradited claimed that he will be subjected to uh, degrading human rights, uh, de degrading treatment, and even death, torture and uh, punishment, torture and even death. In uh, this case, the court held that uh, this was valid and the person was not extradited. Um, Extradition has a lot of issues that have direct relation with issues of politics. And this is, uh, was, very, uh, was very evidenced in uh, Augusto Pinochet's case. Augusto Pinochet was uh, president of Chile, Chile, was a former Chilean president who had served for around 17 years. And uh, during that time, there was around three, over 3,000 disappearances and thousands of to, uh, issues of torture. So he was arrested on his visit to London and he was to be subjected to extradition to Spain. But uh, the politics that played part in that, uh, so Augusto, Augusto Pinochet not extradited to uh, face the rule of law uh, in, in Spain. Uh, another issue of concern, another case that we can look at is the case of uh, uh, Pastor Dea, Gilbert Dea, which, uh, well, Pastor Dea, for Pastor Dea's case, the Kenyan uh, police uh, issued a warrant of arrest for Gilbert Dea for child trafficking and, uh, yeah, because he, he used to run a ministry that said that Pastor Dea had the power to help barren women to give birth. So working with, together with the wife, they would steal children and uh, have them uh, transferred or trafficked to uh, other countries. And uh, he would appear to be blessing those women through prayers and uh, helping them to get babies. So he applied in London not to be extradited. And he claimed that uh, if he was extradited to Kenya, he would face death sentence and even uh, degrading and inhuman treatment. But uh, in 2011, in 2011, the, he, after he had exploited all the channels of appeal, uh, Pastor Dea was extradited to Kenya and uh, um, certain, his case is still ongoing. His case on uh, child trafficking is still ongoing in our, in our Kenyan courts. Um, so another, another case is the one that you mentioned of the Akasha, Akasha brothers, the Bakhtash and the Ibrahim who are extradited uh, to, the DE, uh, to the US through the DEA for conspiring to smuggle 98 kilograms of uh, heroin to the US. And uh, this is one of the success that we can see. So uh, Mr. Robert, I will say that uh, even when someone is subjected to extradition. There are some rights that they are, they are entitled to. Those are the main rights are the right to life, prohibition from torture, and uh, other forms of cruel and inhuman treatment, prohibition from uh, slavery, and not to be subjected from laws that are inexistent at the time. 
Thank you very much. Back to you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, you brought a very interesting topic. So uh, I will still shift to Professor uh, Robert Perry. So uh, we have uh, this issue of uh, doctrine of uh, immunity in relation to extradition. So uh, we have where head of states committees, uh, for example, Al Bashir commits a, an offense. So what are some of the immunities uh, when it comes to extradition? Also, uh, this also question will go to. Uh, uh, the issue of uh, extradition in terms of immunity when it comes to the East African community. First, uh, Professor. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, immunity is a very interesting um, issue in this uh, in this setting, and immunity is a is a larger legal concept. I think your um, I think uh, our audience today will will have some understanding that uh, there are situations where people cannot be prosecuted, uh, not because their crimes, not because their alleged conduct is not criminal, but because the nature of their position is such that um, that they can't be uh, can't be prosecuted by the by the state at that particular time. Um, as far as immunity from extradition goes, uh, that's very much a matter of domestic law, whether individuals can be held uh, immune from extradition process. But at the international level, um, you, there's a difference between immunity. Uh, well, but I think, I'm, sorry, I'm going to try to be clear. A better way to put it is this. Sometimes people are able to be prosecuted for a crime because the crime itself is, you know, is recognized as, a, say, a major international crime, and they would otherwise be able to be extradited, except that they are currently a sitting public official. So, for example, if the, uh, the president of, uh, of a country was accused of a war crime in a, in a foreign country, they cannot be arrested and extradited while they are the sitting president. And the same would be true of the foreign minister and other, other senior government ministers. That would make them, uh, so they are immune from extradition because of the nature of their position at that, uh, at that point. And that kind of immunity is something that is respected by countries on a, on a state to state level, on a bilateral level. So, uh, you know, the, a sitting public official of one state cannot be subjected to the courts of another state. That's the idea of state immunity. Um, there are uh, some interesting decisions out of the International Court of Justice that can be read if people are interested. Uh, the case involving uh, the Congo and Belgium in uh, DRC and Belgium in 2000 is an interesting one there. And also the Italy versus Germany case, which is uh, it's a bit later, I think 2015. Um, and and that, you know, that, that's the idea. There are certain immunities that, that attach to people, not because of their personal status, but because of the nature of their position uh, in government. Now, what has been interesting uh, in the last, I guess, 20 years is the, I, well, in fact, this goes back to, uh, to the Nuremberg prosecutions after World War II in Germany, where the Nuremberg Tribunal held that there are certain kinds of crimes from which state officials cannot be immune, uh, even if the act was carried out within the regular scope of their public duties, such as war crimes, such as what we now call uh, crimes against humanity, such as what we now call uh, genocide. So that, there's an interesting uh, distinction there then that's made between uh, substantive immunity and functional immunity. Because what I was describing a, a moment ago was functional immunity, the idea that a person, even if they are accused of a crime for which they can be prosecuted, cannot be subjected to legal processes because they are currently a functioning member of a, of a government. Whereas the substantive immunity, the idea uh, after Nuremberg was uh, if a state official orders or, or even commits horrible crimes uh, to be perpetrated upon 
either foreign armies, uh, foreign citizens, or even their own citizens, they're not immune from prosecution for the crime, but they are immune from arrest and immune from prosecution until they stop being a sitting official. So that's how, you know, th that's an important piece of the state to state enterprise. Now, in the last 20 years, with the um, the advent of the International Criminal Court, and uh, even before that, with the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, uh, there was another uh, uh, another stroke uh, played for justice here, in that if the offense is being tried by an international tribunal, there is a possibility that uh, that the individual can be indicted and can even possibly be prosecuted, even though they are still a sitting state official. So while one country's courts could not try a foreign, uh, a foreign state official while he or she is still a government official, an international court in some circumstances can. And that, of course, is where, um, is where we saw the, the indictment issued by the International Criminal Court for President al-Bashir. Uh, that, you know, that was an unusual thing, right? Because the, the, the gentleman, of course, was the sitting president of the, uh, of the country at that point. But the International Criminal Court asserted, asserted the authority to charge him, to indict him nonetheless. So that was quite unusual, but that, that precedent went back to the Yugoslavia Tribunal, which also indicted the sitting president of, uh, of Serbia at the time. So extradition plays into all of these issues in various ways, as you, will as you can see. It, uh, just to sum up, it begins with is the individual immune from the particular act because it was uh, an act of government? Uh, if they are not, if, if it wasn't, then they may be prosecuted for the crime, but they may be immune from being extradited until they stop being a sitting uh, public official. I hope that's I hope that's helpful and answers your question, Robert. Yes. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to the development of uh, jurisprudence uh, in matters of extradition, uh, in particular the Versailles Treaty and the role of uh, the Netherlands and the US uh, to refuse extradition. So, uh, what is the international development of uh, the jurisprudence on extradition? I just missed the last part, Robert. Sir, what's the international? The, the international jurisprudence, or uh, when it comes to the developed jurisprudence on uh, the, the next edition. Yeah, so that's so interesting because um, most of the of the case law having to do with extradition is is domestic cases, and and we have I've heard from uh, from the honor judge and from the uh, the uh, distinguished lawyer from the DPP and and the other speakers about. The, about extradition cases that go on. You know, Kenya has extradition cases, Canada, the US, Britain, Japan. Um, so when you say, you know, where is, and this might be of interest from a research point of view as well, when we say, where is the extradition jurisprudence? It is mostly in case law of individual countries, which is, you know, which is logical because in each case of extradition, there has to be consideration, or you know, virtually always, there has to be consideration of the matter by a domestic court. Um, one, and I can tell you from the point of view of somebody who researches extradition that uh, that presents enormous research challenges. Uh, because as you can imagine, and, and as I'm sure some of our audience know, it can be quite difficult to research the domestic case law of, of foreign countries. So I'm very well trained in how to research Canadian law. That's that's not a problem. I know how to research Canadian law, but it it, it can be very difficult uh, to find extradition court decisions and even government decisions. Ex, you know, extradition decisions made by by governments uh, from other states. Um, it, it's better than it used to be, of course, because there are lots of international uh, databases. There's the World Lead database. There you can usually get your hands on all of the Commonwealth uh, decisions now. But even so, you know, th there are research difficulties. And of course, you can be blocked by language also. I'm a, I'm a unilingual uh, English speaker myself. I speak French well enough just because I'm Canadian, but I don't, uh, I don't read French very well in law. Uh, so when I want to uh, do any kind of wide ranging uh, research on extradition, I'm really bound to try to get hold of, uh, of domestic cases from many countries. And that, that is quite challenging. 
but of course, uh, as as uh, some of the other speakers have averred to, there are other uh, areas where extradition is considered. And what I'm thinking of in particular is the human rights courts and human rights tribunals. So if you're looking for jurisprudence about extradition, you will find lots, for example, from the European Court of Human Rights, which has had to consider extradition cases uh, quite frequently over the years, from the Human Rights Committee of the uh, United Nations, and, and that body uh, considers whether states are complying with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is another example. So there are these human rights, international human rights bodies that will uh, consider extradition cases. The questions there always being, did a particular extradition breach human rights or not? And finally, uh, occasionally there is an ex a matter regarding extradition that would come before the International Court of Justice. Uh, there haven't been uh, there haven't been very many. Uh, a couple involving Belgium, the Belgium and DRC case that I mentioned a few minutes ago is one because extradition was was potentially at play uh, there. So you will find uh, some extradition jurisprudence at the international level, but most of it is at the domestic level. Thank you very much, Professor. So uh, to you, uh, Steve Macau, so uh, the, the, the regional aspect on- Robert, uh, yes. uh, Robert uh, there's something very important on the issue of uh, jurisprudence that the professor has spoken about, eh? because the professor has said, uh, I said that majority of this can be found in the, in the domestic jurisprudence of a country. I think I'll come to Kenya. In Kenya, we have this case of Toroha Mohammed, Toroha versus Republic. This is a matter that was had, uh, was had at the Court of Appeal in 1988. And basically the court decided that uh, it is fundamental that there cannot be extradition where fair trial cannot be guaranteed. Eh? That is the leading case law on extradition when it comes to Kenya. That is uh, Toroha Mohammed Toroha versus Republic. And the way I see this manifested, uh, this is mainly manifested in the defense of uh, the suspects that are to be extradited. Because they always say that um, the country, they always say that the receiving country is a country which does not have the rule of law to speak, or maybe they just feel that the justice, uh, they just feel that there's a, there's a problem with the justice sector of that country. And that is how it operates as a defense. I'll be able to take this chance to push it through. Then uh, I also know, the other reason is, uh, okay, now that, that is Prevention of Torture Act. Prevention of Torture Act uh, forbids the country to extradite uh, people to scenarios where they'll be facing torture. And just as Mr. Saruni has said, under the, under the Refugee Act, there's also a clause to, yes, that we cannot extradite eh? a refugee, that basically is there. Yeah? I just wanted to add that so that we don't lose focus in the discussion. Thank you so much, Robert. Back to you. Robert, yeah. and just to add to that, before the DPP makes a decision on whether to file extradition proceedings, those are all factors we look into. It's not every request that comes that goes to court. In, we have a right to decline an extradition request on these factors. So one thing I can guarantee everybody that DPP is very keen about the requests that come and the ones that we take to court we must be satisfied beyond doubt that the human rights issues have been taken care of. There's a rule of law in that respective country and, and especially Kenyans who are going to be extradited to other countries. We are very keen to ensure that even though the Kenyan is extradited to that particular country, justice must prevail. And that is where even the Ministry of Foreign Affairs comes into place. But even when we're extraditing, especially a Kenyan, we must inform our Ministry of Foreign Affairs who will then inform our embassies or consulates in that respective country to inform them that there's a Kenyan coming and then thereafter they are, they, it is their role to ensure that the rights of the Kenyan are met. And another thing we take into consideration is reciprocity. Are we, country cannot keep requesting for a person to be extradited from Kenya. And yet when we ask for fugitives in that respective country, they decline. That is another consideration we take into. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, to uh, Macau. So, uh, what are uh, the defenses to extradition? Uh, when it comes to extradition, when you are representing a client who is uh, uh, who is extradited, what are some of the defenses that uh, uh, come with? Mr. Steve Macau. Uh, I think there's a problem with the connection of Mr. Macau. Yes. Perhaps if you can just uh, if, if you can just allow me to give you the kind of challenges that arise when uh, uh, when this issue is presented to court. Okay, because I know for sure the first thing that uh, causes uh, a big problem is the issue, it is the issue of the bail, yeah? Because the court has the discretion to grant bail even in extradition cases. So the challenge that exists is that uh, if, if we are seeking to extradite someone and the person is given bail, is that not a reason to be, to be, to be a flight risk, yeah? And then uh, the other issue which uh, I know is of concern is the, it is the, uh, I think the task of the court, I'll call it the, the task of the court. Eh? The time the application for extradition was presented to court, eh? the court at times can be able to bulge into the issue of whether the person is guilty or not guilty of a crime that he or she is going to face. Eh? And that is something which the courts are, are, they are actually trying to desist from. Because as soon as the court enters into the parameters of finding if whether the person is guilty or not guilty of the offense, then the issues become a bit uh, convoluted. Eh? I've also spoken uh, about the issue of the fair trial, because article, as you know so well, Article 50 of our constitution talks about uh, fair trial, then is there any right? Of the suspect that is going to be infringed when it comes to fair trial. At least I've seen in some scenarios. I remember there's a report by the, I remember there's a report by the, I think it was the, uh, let me just run, Amnesty. I think somebody had wanted to introduce the rankings for countries based on human rights as per the, the categories that is provided for by, uh, by Amnesty International. And I think that was quite, yeah. So basically, those are the three main hot issues when it comes to extradition for a court. Eh? I'll give it back to you, Robert. Yeah, uh, maybe I can interject and just add uh, from what uh, Honorable Kudro has, uh, has, has said, and uh, some of other things that can really work in favor if someone does not want to be extradited is uh, to prove to court that there is a contradiction of uh, jurisdiction. And uh, it, I think the court will uh, the court will certainly consider issues where uh, there is no treaty around uh, between the two the two states. Uh, so contradiction in conflict in laws that is something that the courts will look at. Again, is the lack of criminality if uh, the crime that you are requesting to be the requesting state is uh, claiming the person has committed is not a, cri a criminal offense in the uh, country where the person is. The other is uh, political protection because uh, extradition is a very political affair and uh, some people may receive political protection. And uh, yeah, there, I think the last one I would say is the issues of human rights violation. If you can be able to prove to court that your human rights will be violated if you're extradited to a different state. That is something that the court will uh, really consider. Back to you, Chair. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the, I've learned a lot myself. As a researcher, you know, when it comes to matter of extradition, I, I've, I've learned a lot, a lot from this. So I'll, I'll go to the question and answer section. Uh, I told people to send their questions. I can see uh, Mr. Rahim, the, the hand is up too. I mean, the, 
Yes, uh, good afternoon. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Yes, my question is directed to Ms. Catherine Maniki, the ODPP. I've been having a challenge really trying to reconcile the, the applicable parts in the contiguous act, CAP 76. You notice under the act, there's a part two, and then there's part three. The part two is meant to apply specifically to countries that are stated, yeah, like the, to certain specific countries that have been, uh, you know, uh, outlined by the AG in an order. And part three is also to apply to specific countries. So when we're talking about, let's say, extradition between countries in the East African region, let's say Uganda and Kenya or Tanzania and Kenya, we are, um, I, I believe that the Contiguous Act should apply. But what I'm, I'm you know, I'm not really uh, in agreement or rather just having conflict over is what particular part is to apply? Is it the reciprocal backing of uh, warrants under part three? or part two where you, uh, where you talk about surrender and where the procedure is sort of like uh, a little long in terms of this committal. It's sort of almost the same as in the Commonwealth, uh, rather Commonwealth uh, Act, whereas in part three, and which actually the courts of Kenya have said that that particular part is the one that applies to extradition between Tanzania and Kenya or Uganda and Kenya. And that part three only talks about reciprocal backing of warrants. Apparently, you don't need like the whole procedure, you know, uh, of taking these people to court, commit to proceedings, and all that. All you need is like a warrant from the requesting country, and, yeah, and that suffices. What would you say about that? Um, if I can respond to that, and um, let me also clarify that. I believe Tanzania and Uganda fall under Commonwealth countries. Um, Commonwealth countries, what governs them is uh, CAP 77. That is Extradition Commonwealth Countries Act. So any extradition that is in reference to any country under the Commonwealth will solely fall under CAP 76. So all the procedures in terms of uh, how to arrest uh, a fugitive, uh, arraigning him in court, uh, the process of the court is solely governed under CAP 77. For CAP 76 is for all other countries in which Kenya has signed a treaty with will fall and be governed under CAP 76. So you will find the procedure, the, the main difference of variance between countries in the Commonwealth and the ones not in the Commonwealth is especially that instrument that starts the process. So the process for Commonwealth, as I stated, is that uh, it is started by uh, an authority to proceed. That is the document. Like for instance, in a court, you have the plaint, a notice, a notice of motion. So for Commonwealth countries, it is an authority to proceed. For other countries, is uh, CAP 76, and the instrument that is used is an order. The difference between the two acts, once you go through them, is just um, expansion of the language. But if in, simplest, in simple form, you will find that the process is the same. Reciprocal backing of the warrant is basically like, for instance, a country has gotten a warrant of arrest. And even the Commonwealth countries must have that warrant of arrest we then send it to court. And how do we start the process again? Uh, we start the process again uh, through an order for CAP 77. And um, if you print the CAP 76, you will find all the orders or uh, the treaties or the countries that we have signed against this CAP 76 that is for contiguous countries. So there's no big difference, uh, but just know that Uganda, all Commonwealth countries will not fall under this act. We'll all move to CAP 77. But in simple terms, if you look at the process, it's the same. How we go to court, what happens in court, what we expect from the judiciary and the processes and the, um, the restrictions of surrender, what, what can one rely on, or what can even the ODPP rely on not to uh, accept uh, 
a request, an extradition request. You will see them there. But uh, just try and understand that the process is the same. The language will be different. One will have a little bit of some complex words, but in essence, the process is the same. And I believe that would assist you um, understand the difference between Commonwealth countries and restrictions. And I'm seeing part two and part three of CAP 76. Part two I'm seeing is the surrender of a fugitive criminal. Part three is the reciprocal backing of warrants. And again, that is just the process. What happens from the beginning? Okay, we should have started with reciprocal backing of warrants and then the surrender of the fugitive. What happens then after? But the process is still the same. Am I clear um, or am yeah. I confusing you? Uh, yeah, thank you, Catherine. You are, but is it okay if I just ask a follow up kindly? Yes. <laughs> See, uh, previously also, well, previously I also thought uh, Uganda and Tanzania are Commonwealth countries, so CAP 77 should apply. But then uh, I've been, like I did a lot of, you know, research on Kenya law and all the case laws that actually came across were saying CAP 76 is the applicable law. The problem is I'm not able to reconcile how is it that, you know, they're saying the court case law is saying CAP 76 is the applicable law, yet I really, have like it's so confusing to just reconcile what act is the applicable law and what is you know not because ideally the reason given was that uh there's a legal notice that uh you know kenya and uganda entered uh an agreement and it's by by legal notice number 95 i don't know of 1995 something like that yeah that says uh cap 76 should be the applicable law between tanzania and kenya and uh, kenya and uganda but I stand guided. Let me guide you. Uh, currently, we have not signed any extradition treaty with Uganda. It's in the process. So that one, I can reassure you, we have not signed any extradition treaty with Uganda. We've also not signed with Tanzania. One of the African countries that we have signed an extradition treaty is Rwanda. But if you look at the preamble at the beginning of CAP 77, which says, an act of parliament to make provisions for the surrender by Kenya to other Commonwealth countries or persons accused or convicted of offenses in those countries, ETC. So um, uh, one thing I'm 100% sure we cannot, in fact, if a fugitive criminal realizes that is wanted by a Commonwealth country and we have filed an order Trust me, my dear, that would be the first ground and the application will be thrown out. It's quite clear that CAP 77 is for Commonwealth. I don't know whether it's, um, I will not fault the court because I've not seen those rulings, but uh, I don't know whether it is a type or not understand because we've had instances of courts uh, also confusing CAP 77 and CAP 76. And at times we have raised, but it's important that you understand that CAP 77 relates to Commonwealth countries only. All other countries must then fall under CAP 76. And we must sign a treaty with them. And behind this statute, you will see all the countries that we have signed treaties with. And uh, once we signed with Uganda, I will definitely let you know, but it is in the process. It's in the negotiation process. Thank you. I hope I'm clear now. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Okay, it's uh, another question from uh, Brenda Wangila. Uh, you mentioned the role of uh, government in Kenya. Can someone comment on the role of Antony General vis a vis the Director of Public Prosecution, DPP, in deserving extradition requests? I will. Just mention as it is, as that is one of the issues that is before the Supreme Court in the Okemo Gisheru matter. Um, but uh, currently, what is happening is that uh, extradition requests come from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs through diplomatic channels, and I am going as it is in the book. Um, we have been initiating the process in court. So the Attorney General will then uh, hand over the extradition package to us, we then initiate in court. Not something I should con uh, converse with because for us, we are of view, this is a criminal, um, it's a criminal, it's basically a criminal offenses 
offenses committed in other countries. Those are the issues that have been discussed in the Supreme Court. I don't want to delve much in, but um, another role for the Attorney General is once we get the extradition order and there is no appeal pending in court or either through the application of a habeas corpus, and we are within the 14 range, the Attorney General then signs what we call a warrant of surrender. And that warrant of surrender is what the final document that gives Kenya the authority to remove someone from the country. So it is just not only the court order, but the Attorney General then must give the final warrant of surrender. And that is the document that is used by the foreign countries to confirm to their respective countries that this person was actually surrendered in court. So we have two documents, the order from court and the warrant of surrender signed by the Attorney General. But what we have been doing in court, the documents to initiate the proceedings in court, that is the authority to proceed under CAP 77 and the order under CAP 76 have both been signed by the, by the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Director of Public Prosecutions has been prosecuting these extradition matters in court. But as I've encouraged you, please follow up the Supreme Court uh, uh, application and uh, the ruling that will be delivered it was in court today, so you can follow up and see which case number. And then uh, you, then a firm decision will be made on the exact role of the Attorney General and the DPP in regard to extradition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from Stephen Ikonyo. Uh, would the magistrate court have the jurisdiction to hear an application for orders in the nature of other scopers from the fugitive? Uh, Honorable Radin. Uh, yes, sir. for asking, I'm sorry, I just never got the last part of the question. Yes, would, would the magistrate would, would the magistrate courts have the jurisdiction to hear an application for orders in the nature of abbas corpus from the fugitive? Yes, um, from the way I know anything in relation to habeas corpus, that is a reserve of the high court. Yeah. The court can only deal with that issue of extradition under the two statutes which have been mentioned. Eh? But anything in terms of Fabius Corpus, that is for the High Court. I believe that one is, is loaded clear. And yes, Robert, just to, just to expound that, what happens in the order of a Habeas Corpus, once the magistrate's court uh, uh, agree with us that this person can be extradited, the criminal fugitive can then make an application in the high court in each of a habeas corpus. That is basically what is provided in the statute. So the person then has to move to the high court for other orders, and then they will deal with the issues on whether he can be extradited or not. And then it goes to the court of appeal, as Honorable Radin said, those are the levels of appeal. Yeah, yes, madam. So uh, you. Well, what are the documents? I remember you said you talk about the documents that are required for an extradition. Uh... Uh, documents uh, in regard to extradition, and I'm going to first start with Kenya being a requesting state, a fugitive is in a certain country. What we would require is the, the warrant of arrest. We will require the identification details of the fugitive. For instance, his ID number, his uh, passport number. We will require his passport, uh, his photo, his photo. And uh, we will require maybe his passport details. We will require what we call the travel itinerary to confirm because if we are making a request, we'll have to be making to a specific country, for instance, Uganda. We will need to, uh, to get the travel itinerary to confirm that he actually traveled to Uganda. We will require contact details or, and uh, as we do extradition, we both do, this is the formal way of doing extradition. We combine it with informal uh, cooperation where Interpol or other agencies would be able to ascertain for us prior to preparing the document that he actually traveled to Uganda and is in Uganda and in Uganda, which particular place? Because a country can't ask us for a fugitive criminal in Kenya and not try and give us specific places is the person in Nairobi, Mombasa, it can't be general. So we do informal investigations prior to. So, and, and uh, basically we must provide evidence to show the, of the connection of the offense and the accused person. So basically what we do is the, put the investigative diary, we put 
uh, statements from the investigation file to prove that an offense was committed and uh, basically by this person. And then there's also the affidavit from the investigating officer to show that this person was being investigated on this uh, offense, a crime was committed, there's a warrant, they went to court on this particular day and they were issued a warrant of arrest. So those are the main documents we attach to our extradition request as we are seeking the extradition of a fugitive outside Kenya. Documents to Kenya, we will require similar things. We will require the extradition request itself from the respective country. We will require the warrant of arrest from the respective country. We will require identification documents and uh, we encourage again passport number, uh, phone contacts, uh, photos, because when we are to arrest somebody in Kenya, we need to know that we have arrested the right person. We will also need evidence to show what offense was committed. Again, we are trying to look at the criminality. We will need to show, uh, we will need them to confirm for us that this was not a, it's not a political nature offense. And uh, uh, basically they'll also need to attach uh, ex 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 excerpts of uh, the, their statutes, their laws in Kenya, uh, sorry, in their respective country. And even for us in Kenya, when we are sending our request, we must, if it's a penal code offense, we must attach, we must need to know the, uh, the sentence that's important to us because for us, we cannot extradite someone on trivial offenses. That one, one of the issues that has not been discussed here is that for trivial offenses, we cannot extradite somebody and we will not accept an extradition on trivial offenses amongst other things that have been mentioned today. So those are the main documents that we will require in a, in an extradition request from other countries. Thank you. Yes, oh, uh, what are the examples of uh, the trivial offenses? Trivial offenses, we call them almost some misdemeanors in Kenya. There's some, not all misdemeanors, but some misdemeanors. You know, but each case is looked at its own merit, but it has to, definitely fall within offenses that are misdemeanors. But uh, we also look at which kind of misdemeanor, but uh, trivial, because um, one of the issues the court also determines on whether to grant us the orders is whether it's a trivial offense. So for us, we have to ensure it's not a trivial, but it must fall under the category of misdemeanors. Um, you saying a uh, very informative session. My question to the panelists, be what happens in situation where extradition proceedings and the refugee status determination are proceedings? How does the court handle the prejudice? I think this goes to Honorable Wilson Rady. Uh, Robert, I think that is a classical case of the scenarios where the court is able to find itself in a fixed position. Because as you are all aware, we are a signatory to the Refugee Act, eh? and then uh, I don't know. I'll take the example of of Rwanda and use Rwanda as an example just to illustrate this. Eh? If you remember, we had a scenario where we had some Rwandese here. Then uh, it's like they were also okay. It's like it's like these people were criminals, and then at the same time, it happened that they had filed uh, okay, they had filed for status to be taken as uh, refugees. The case which I know and is alive is a matter that is before the criminal appeal court. Eh? I'll be able to share with you because I, I, believe, I believe the judgment was just given some two weeks back. Eh? I'll share with you on that one. Eh? But uh, it's a scenario where the court is left in a juxtaposition position because in most of the time, you will find that uh, the interest of the country that is trying to extradite is what seems to be of importance. Eh? It's not really that somebody who wants to be given the status of refugee or political asylum, eh? but I'll share I'll share with you the case and then we'll be able to really continue from there. But like there, I've already said, it's a scenario of a juxtaposition. But now that you've asked me, I would believe that uh, if we extradite the person, then that will defeat the reason why the person is asking for asylum in the first place. Yes, Robert. 
Yes, okay. Uh, Robert, just Robert, just to answer that, what we have done in a scenario, there's also a life case in court, we are letting them finalize the extradition, uh, the refugee process. Um, one was also seeking asylum, the was declined, but they have appealed. We are letting them finalize that process as much as we have filed in court, because at times we get to hear these issues whilst we filed our ex our documents in court, but we are letting them final finalize. So we expect to hear from the refugee board and for the asylum and all that, and then uh, we'll then be able to make a determination after. But they are given that as a first or a priority opportunity before the extradition process is completed. And Robert, if it's uh, of any assistance, I can add that uh, this matter, this exact kind of situation has been dealt with in Canada uh, by a case from the Supreme Court of Canada more than 10 years ago. And uh, the situation, if I'm understanding the honored speakers correctly, the situation in Canada is very similar. Uh, the determination of the refugee claim takes precedence over extradition because the, and it's because of the human rights based nature of the problem that confronts the government, right? Which is you don't want to run the risk of extraditing someone back to the state that is going to persecute them from which they're, they're you know, seeking to be a refugee. So the, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada basically laid out requirements that the, the immigration authorities and the Canadian government and the justice authorities uh, ensure that, that they're in communication uh, about the matter and that proper consultations are engaged in and that the um, the refugee claim be completed if it's in process or uh, in that case that case in fact dealt with an after the fact issue which is what if uh, a refugee who is present in Canada is alleged to have committed a crime that would exclude them from refugee status and, and that too requires, uh, you know, intergovernmental, intragovernmental uh, consultation. Uh, again, all with the goal of ensuring that, an, that a refugee, a bona fide refugee, is not, uh, is not expelled and thus face uh, persecution back in their home state. Yes, uh, okay, yeah, so uh, I can see two ads. The rest. So we we'll take these last two questions. The the comments section. I'll take the questions. I'll post in my email there. I'll share the question with the panelists. Then I will reply to the emails. So uh, first we start with the uh, Stephanie Konyo ladies first. Then uh, to Mr. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I mean, good evening. I'd like to first thank the speakers for today. Um, it has been a very informative session. So I have two follow-up questions to what Ms. Catherine was saying um, on CAP 76 and CAP 77. There has been a ruling, I think I posted it on the chat. It's the Aliao um, Somo Abdi, it was in the High Court, and they said that um, CAP 76 is what governs extradition between Uganda and Kenya. So how do you reconcile that with what's going on in practice? And then the second question that I had was, um, if the fugitive criminal is already in custody, I'm sorry if you've already asked this, but if the fugitive criminal is already in custody, so for example, if they've been detained by, let's say, the Ministry of Defense, um, who are investigating certain transnational crimes that this person may have been involved in, what application does the ODPP make to the court? So do they ask for a production order? Do they ask for summons? to the um, Ministry of Defense requesting for this person to be produced in court, or do they still request for a warrant of arrest? Thank you. Um, I'm still trying to also reconcile with uh, what you have talked about, but uh, again, if we have a clear statute on Commonwealth countries, and I've read for you what the Act of Parliament is all about, um, my advice to you is uh, move with CAP 77 for Commonwealth countries. Just move with CAP 77. Uh, because if you notice that uh, extradition are basically treaty based. And for Commonwealth countries, we hold on what we are calling the Harare scheme, the London scheme. And uh, we then do not need to sign extradition treaties with those respective countries within the Commonwealth because they hold on to that 
because they hold on to that uh, um, treaty. Um, if we don't have a treaty with Uganda, and that I'm telling you, we don't have a treaty with Uganda, it will then be difficult for us then to seek extradition, an extradition from Uganda or Uganda to seek an extradition from us if they're coming under CAP 76. Because CAP 76, we then need to then have a treaty with them which needs to be gazetted and you will then find it in this uh, act, as you will see, there are so many orders. Or uh, if you go through the recent um, CAP 77, you'll find different with different countries. If Uganda is not here, then it will then be difficult. And especially if the offense was not transnational in nature, where we can then run to the various conventions, which according which earlier said, Article 2, sub Article 6 of the Constitution will then assist us to go, for instance, to the transnational organized crime on corruption, or on, on organized crime, sorry, or even the UNCAC. So my advice to you is uh, Commonwealth countries, which we have not signed treaties, please go to CAP 77. And this is advice I'm giving you. Any country that we have signed a treaty with, easily go to CAP 76. And it is so hard if we have not signed a treaty with. Um, what we go to court is uh, basically we make an application and we seek a warrant of arrest, a fresh warrant of arrest. And that warrant of arrest is the warrant of arrest, the, the DCI officers or the National Police Service, let me say, the National Police Service will use to arrest a fugitive in Kenya and then present him before the magistrate's court. So that is what we do. We proceed. It is a document I will give to Robert, deducted, I'll give to Robert for you to be able to see because it is in a format, it's in a specific format, and I'll also give him the order which is in a specific format, signed only by the Director of Public Prosecution. And then um, that document, we then put a notice of motion and an application, and we then seek for warrants of arrest. And then basically how we get the fugitive criminals to court for the purposes of a executing an extradition request. Um, I hope so, I'm clear about CAP 77 and CAP 76. I am pleading with you because if you, if from the DPP's office, we file it wrongly, it will be knocked down by someone who is aware of the process properly. So let's go properly. Um, thank you, that was clear, but I have encountered a question where the fugitive criminal is already in custody. So does it make sense to still ask for a warrant of arrest considering that this person is already in custody or what application do you then make to the court? Um, if I can ask you, why is he in custody? On what basis? Um, so he has committed, I think, cattle rustling between two different countries. And so the Ministry of Defense in this scenario has taken him in for the purposes of investigating that crime. So now the question becomes, because the formal procedure is applying for a warrant of arrest, but this person is already in custody. So it doesn't make sense to apply for a warrant of arrest because this person is not free. So that's why I was asking, would it be a summon to the Ministry of Defense to produce this person? Or would you approach the court to issue a production order to the Ministry of Defense for them to produce this person? To assist you, again, once we get an extradition request, and I'll give you an example from Uganda, and we are satisfied, we file under a miscellaneous application, and basically we've been filing them in Nairobi. We file a, a fresh miscellaneous application, right? A fresh miscellaneous application. And we then, in that miscellaneous application, we then now seek, because this is a totally different matter from what he has been caught about, cattle rustling. Because uh, unless we had initially gone to court under a miscellaneous application, arresting him, seeking for additional time under Article 47, 49. But for us, if we were not involved in that arrest of Kurt Russell, for us, we have gone to court and told the court that we have received an extradition from Uganda dated um, 7th of October, 2021. And in that document, there is an, an, a warrant of arrest from Uganda. In the, it is a fresh matter. It is a new matter before court. And now we'll file it in the Milimani law courts. We then now say we're seeking warrants for him to be brought before this respective miscellaneous court. 
in that court, for instance, on Radin's court. He's not involved in the cattle rustling for another court. He will then issue in respect to this extradition request. If he's in prison or in, a, for instance, prison serving another offense, we will then inform the court that he's in prison. We are therefore asking for production orders, for production orders, for him to be availed for this particular one. But remember the cut wrestling, if the DP, if we for the extradition docket division are not involved in it, it would be so hard for us then to seek for summons for him to be availed. And yet remember it's reciprocal backing of warrants. Already we have a warrant from Uganda. We need to back it up and we'll have we'll back it up by having this other warrant that will be issued in this respective court, for instance, in Radin's court. So to make it easier that way, then that 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 is how we proceed. Thank you. Finally, the Ali. Mr. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I saw uh, Ali raised the raised the hand, so I'm asking if we can um, ask the question, Mr. Ali. We can't hear you. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. We have come to the end of the first uh, first ever series on understanding extradition. It was uh, it, it was uh, very informative. I've learned a lot. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. I've shared the uh, Professor Robert Curry book on uh, the charts. You can uh, buy that book at Amazon. Uh, I'll share this on YouTube. I'll share the, the link uh, on YouTube. So, thank you very much for uh, to you, Professor. I know in Canada now it's around the uh, midday. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's around uh, lunchtime. Um, thank you, Honorable Susan Radin. Uh, thank you for taking your time to come and participate. In this uh, first ever webinar on scientific work uh, expedition laws. Uh, Madam Catherine Waniki, uh, we are very grateful. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Steve Makua, thank you so much for also attending. Uh, Jesse Saruni, thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your support. We could never have done this without you. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for those who attended. Uh, the link will be on my YouTube channel. I'll share my email on my chat. Uh, any question, I'll direct them to the, the panelists. Thank you very much. You have come today. Bye. Thank you to your chair and uh, host another one and please invite uh, all of us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.